Uh, let's go in the talking room. Vince, thanks for coming on the talking room. Thank you. This is great to be here. I, uh, how is how is life for you after Breaking Bad? Did do you feel like you've taken a, a giant giant breath? Uh, I uh, yeah, you know that's a that's a uh, yeah. I mean it just. Uh, I was about to say, I feel like you're taking a giant, giant dump. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it feels like, you know? Not to be crude, but it's yeah. like, oh, my God. You know how you, and then you're like, oh, man. Well, I mean, every, I feel, it, feel it, like 30 years younger. <laughs> everybody had such a catharsis leading up to the ending and the, the break between the last, two, the last two parts of season five. I mean, you obviously must have your own catharsis with it. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it, it, I, I was so worried for so long that it would uh, it would not end well, or, or that it would not be satisfying right. to viewers. And uh, it seems, by and large, that it was. Universally, I, I, <laughs> I'm I'm just uh, it, it felt it was such a huge relief. It was such a huge weight off. Hence my strange analogy. I think. It was <laughs> a big weight off, a big weight off my shoulders. I probably should have gone that way, that that analogy instead. Did you take some time? Did you did you did you head off to Hawaii or something? No, I'm going to do that uh, next week. We're going to uh, the Bahamas. Oh, that, that'll be nice. But uh, it's been really busier than I would have guessed uh, so far after after the ending. I got, I'm getting a lot of wonderful requests. Uh, this is uh, about the most fun one I can think of talking to you, uh, but it, uh, getting to talk to folks about the show and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, last night I got to uh, got to be an actor for the first time. I got to Dan Harmon asked me to to do a uh, a little cameo on the, the, the wonderful TV show Community. Can you say what your role is? I don't know if I'm supposed to. Right. I, I, you know what? I'll give a little. I, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to give away when I'm not. I, I will say that I got I, I got to employ the. Uh, the exclamation "yeehaw" a lot. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. I, I I wanted to start by asking because I'm fascinated by the process of, you know, you're the you're the showrunner, the creator of Breaking Bad, uh, and you have a team of writers in L in L A. Yeah. And then there's the whole production going on in Albuquerque. Are you also shooting in L.A. or is all the sound stages in Albuquerque? All sound stages and all the, uh, uh, all the exterior locations. stuff, location stuff, all of it in Albuquerque. And yeah. you weren't re you weren't required on set the whole time. Right? No, I was not. I, I enjoyed being on the set. That was my preference to be on the set. Yeah. But uh, most of the time, I was uh, here in Los Angeles. I was in Burbank in our little uh, writers' room in our dumpy little office. Uh, that uh, that I miss now. Now that we've uh, now that the rent has uh, now the lease has uh, expired. But uh, I was I was here most of the time. So how how is it possible? I mean, I'm just I find myself astonished by the by the consistent quality of the show over the whole run. And you're how do you maintain that from L.A. to Albuquerque? I mean, I just like you to walk me through the process of picking a team and working with them. To maintain this, I mean, do you end up seeing some dailies where you're like that was terrible, and you guys need to redo that, or do you learn as you go what the what the what the the flavor of the shots ought to be and how the thing ought to progress? Well, it's definitely a group effort. Uh, it always was right from the get go, and um, it it um, the the hardest part of the job was was breaking the episodes, and that was the most that was the part of the job where it was most crucial that I that I be there. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't. As much as I love being on the set, as much as I love directing, and and kibitzing, you know, uh, from one of my one of those canvas directors' chairs behind yeah. the camera, even when I wasn't directing, you know, uh, that was my that was the fun part. But the important part was was breaking those was breaking those stories, and it starts with uh, hiring uh, uh, great actors and a great uh, writers' room. And and once we did that, and you you make your best effort on on on, on both accounts. You. Uh, when you're when you're finding writers, you read big big piles of scripts and you winnow them down to smaller piles. And then now, are the writers writing scripts, or are you guys writing together as a group, or are you writing first drafts and then working it as a group? Once once we have all the writers, once we had the writers' room going, we all sat in rooms very much a table like this, uh, except not quite as nice. Uh, <laughs> and uh, by the way, uh, funny fact: the room we're in right now, uh, we're in uh, Grand Via Productions, uh, mm -hmm. which is Mark Johnson's company, and uh, my my uh, uh, producer Melissa Bernstein and I sat at this very table about seven years ago and met with Brian Cranston for the first time. Wow! He was sitting, I think, over that that way, and we were over on this side. You and didn't meet him when he was in your X Files. I mean, I, I had I had met him, okay. but but the first official meeting uh, at which we said to him, "We would love you, love you, love you for this part of Walter White." 
We would love for that to be the case and for you to agree to that. That happened right here at this table. Did you offer that to him based on a reading or based on knowledge of his work? Uh, knowledge of his work. I had worked with him uh, in an episode of The X-Files yeah. back in like 98 or 99 and I didn't know who he was. I mean, I didn't realize, I mean, the chameleon that he is, I didn't realize I had seen him uh, at that point and in a, a bunch, bunch of other stuff. stuff. He was the guy who sent... Uh, Tom Hanks on his mission. He's the one-armed officer who sends Tom Hanks on his mission in Saving Private Ryan. Right. He was the dentist on Seinfeld. He was. Uh, <laughs> oh right, I totally was, forgot yeah, that part. Yeah, uh, 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 Tim, the dentist. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, he was the, really funny as hell. He was uh, Buzz Aldrin and From the Earth to the Moon. He's he's been in a million things, but he's such a chameleon. I didn't recognize him when he walked into that X Files casting yeah. session so many years ago. He was fantastic in that episode. I filed him away. In my in my noggin there, and thought I got to work with this guy again in the future, and uh, I mean that's the thing I find most astonishing about the show is, like every season, at least once every like ten episodes, he'd bust out some new gesture. Oh yeah, or yeah. move or thing with his voice, yeah. and I'd be thinking he's slow playing us on an arc of what sixty five oh, yeah. hours. Yeah, that's yeah. In crazy. He plays a deep game. He's fantastic, and the other amazing thing about him, he's not. Methody, he's really? not a method. I mean, if I'm using, I think I'm using the the phrase correctly. He's, he snaps in the, in the out sense, of it when the camera. Yeah, rolls. exactly. In okay. the sense that he's not going around tortured in the corner for an hour before they yell rolling. He's he's talking about the baseball game last night, how the Dodgers did to to one of the grips, and you know, and he's saying, ah, no, the guy really hit, and the, you know, in the sixth inning there was that thing, and they say you hear the AD say rolling, and all of a sudden. He's like the guy. Well, I mean, did it's you, just like that. Did you ever write a scene for him and think, I hope he can pull this off and then work with him on something? I mean, I, I look at some of the things like and early on in the show, there's some scenes of him working with Gretchen and he's yeah. much younger. Yeah, and he, yeah, yeah. It's such a great sell because he yeah, really yeah. does look 20 years younger. Good, I'm glad. That, that is a, you're nervous in a moment like that because uh, we have wonderful makeup and hair folks. but. Yeah. It's it's a tricky thing to take twenty years off someone. Yeah. So so you don't worry about the actor at that point. You worry about how the hair and makeup is going to work out. Luckily, but the way he uses voice is so. Well, that's true too. Yeah, he he he. I don't know how he does it. There was one moment we were all worried about. Had nothing to do with Brian, but we were asking him the character to do. We were asking the actor to play a very tricky moment. And this was uh, this was at the end of near the end of season four, when he is desperate to get home and get his family out of town because yeah. Gustavo Fring is going <clears> to <throat> has threatened to kill his entire family and he hurries home and he gets down into the crawl space under the house yeah. and he finds out that uh, Skyler's taken all his money and given it to her lover <laughs> Ted I, I liken it to I know nothing about music or comp musical composition but you know it's easy somewhat easy in theory to compose something that the human hand can't Play, you know, mm -hmm, on a mm -hmm. on a on a keyboard. Yeah. I would imagine, you know, you, no one has long enough fingers to to hit these particular notes in quick succession. We were asking, we we the writers were asking him to go from laughing hyster uh, from from being enraged to laughing hysterically, and we were nervous because we knew we had the greatest actor on TV. Yeah, I'm biased, but hey, it's true. I but, totally agree. But but nonetheless, it was like, can any human being pull this off? And we were. This is the one time I can remember being nervous about asking him to do something we were afraid he wouldn't be able to do, and he just crushed it. He was just yeah. fantastic, just chilling, like watching the dailies. The, the hairs were standing up on the back backs of our necks, and so we were so lucky. It, uh, back to the original question, I guess it starts with hiring. It's easy to collaborate and make something. It's always hard to make anything, but it's 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 it makes it doable to make something really good when you surround yourself with the best people. And we were so lucky, starting with Brian, so lucky to have just the greatest bunch of people. Well, I also want to say I I feel like Walt and Skyler's relationship is one of the most realistic relationships I think I've ever seen on TV. Oh, great! There there are subtleties to the way that they interact that feel so genuine in terms of none of that sort of normal TV tropes of like, I'm upset because I'm jealous or something like that, that there are all these layers. Like there's this moment I remember where Walt is still trying to pretend, you know, he's talking to Jesse, but he wants to pretend to Skylar right. that someone else. They're in the hospital. With right, 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 right. He yeah. says, you'll never know who that is. And she just gives him a look and walks away. That's <laughs> yeah. just devastating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anna Gunn did an amazing job. She's fantastic. Anna Gunn's just fantastic. We, 
I mean, I, I got to give. I got to start by giving credit to our casting people, uh, Sharon Bialy and Sherry Thomas, yeah. uh, and Russell Scott, their their casting associate. Uh, these 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 folks found. Well, they found Anna Gunn, for instance. I was familiar with Anna Gunn from uh, from the TV show Deadwood, right. excellent TV show. I think she's the only character in that show who who uh, who didn't get to curse. That was, uh, <laughs> she was the uh, very upstanding wife. But I, and I thought she was great on that. But I wouldn't have. That's the genius of these casting directors. I wouldn't have put two and two together and thought that woman I saw in Deadwood. Maybe we should look at right. her for the wife. My son had told me that Skinny Pete was actually an accomplished pianist, and I was really happy to see him actually playing yeah. the piano later on in one of the. We we put, we had to we we had to put that in once <laughs> once we learned that we we thought well, we got to have some moment where he's, you know, uh, you feel really good when those moments arrive. They they needed. They needed uh, roadie, roadie cases. Yeah. So where do you buy roadie cases? You go to you know a guitar store or whatever, music store, an instrument store. And then when you're when you're there, obviously, let's have Skinny Pete try out the keyboard. You yeah. Know? And that was that was a lot of fun getting to do that. When you're writing some of the things like putting a meth lab in a bunch of roadie cases yeah. and putting it in a bug bomb house, do you? I'm sure some of your stuff you're getting maybe from research with law enforcement, but are you finding any copycats to the stuff that you guys have done? Is anyone dyeing their meth blue? Uh, <laughs> apparently so. Oh, apparently. Now, to be fair, uh, I thought that this this came about purely because of Breaking Bad, and then I was I was cleaning out my office uh, when the lease ran out on the uh, on our offices, and, I, and we got out of there, and I'm looking through old stuff I had an old newspaper clippings and stuff I hadn't looked at in, in eight or nine years. And I found something about colored meth. And this was before we came up with our blue oh, wow. meth. I'd, it's one of those things, maybe you, you read it in and the then it sublimates it. or whatever. It goes into your subconscious. But having said that, there apparently has been a, a slew of new uh, blue meth uh, inspired by the show, which I got to be honest, it's one of those things, on the one hand, you're like, man, I'm glad people are watching. <laughs> but <laughs> even, even meth producers, you know, yeah. but on the other hand, you're like, oh, Jesus. It's like, ugh. You know? <laughs> so, so how much, when you're, like, you said we had to put in Pete playing the piano. We didn't have to. We just thought oh, it would No, fun. I know, yeah, but yeah. I mean, obviously yeah. you guys are writing also to the actor's strengths and yeah. writing to the things that they can do. Absolutely. So you, do you get, did you get suggestions from actors about things that they wanted to try, or would they have contributions to a plot about? They had nothing but contributions. Having said that, I, don't, I can't think of, there may be an example, but I can't think off the top of my head of a time where they came and said, for instance, you know, I'm a pretty good juggler, can I juggle it, right, or whatever. Right, right. They, but they contributed constantly in ways that they themselves are probably not even aware of. You. This is the thing, one of the many things I love about television, it's 100 hours worth of, worth of story. Yeah. I mean, in our case, 62, but, but you get the point. Versus a two hour movie, the fundamental difference, they're very much the same thing in terms of the camera equipment you use and the lights and the, it, if you get beamed into a movie set versus a television, especially a one hour drama set, you know, not knowing anything about it, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And right. it looks like the same set. But what's fundamentally different about the two structurally is when you embark on a movie, there's not that much opportunity for discovery. You, you know the ending. Right. You know, hopefully you'll go in with, with a finished script that yeah. you're, you're proud of and you, you know is, you believe is going to work. You, you, find, you make little minute discoveries along the way uh, and you, you adjust and, and tr tuck and trim and you know, whatever as you, as you proceed. But you get to do more of that over the course of many years on yeah. a TV series. And, and one of the things you get to do is, is you get to know your actors really, really well in a way that you don't have time to on a movie. And all the writers really get to know them. Yeah, well, uh, there, are really show runners who, there, are, there are show runners who try to keep their, uh, there are shows in which. People the, are more the, sequestered. Yeah, I, I didn't like doing that. I wanted everyone to, yeah. I wanted communication every which direction. I wanted everybody to know everybody. And when that happens, it seems to me that, that by osmosis, perhaps, uh, uh, you learn about your actors and you incorporate, even subconsciously, their strengths and their interests and their complexities as a human being, as a real life person, into the characters. A good example being uh, Dean Norris, who plays Hank. If you look back at that first episode of Breaking Bad, which is the only one I worked on alone before I had right. a group 
to work with. That was the only one that I broke by myself. Hank, in that episode, in part because there's not a lot of time in 45 minutes, 47 minutes, in part because I didn't have the help and the, the wonderful extra brains at my disposal. But in that episode, Hank is kind of schematic. He's yeah. a little schematic <clears throat> as a character. He's, he's kind of, hey, hey, buddy, how you doing? He's a hail fellow well met. Yeah. And he exists simply to be everything that Walter White is not. Right. And he's kind of a dick, and, and, uh, but he's good at his job. You get a little bit of that. But he is not even remotely the character that he will yet become. So much credit needs to be given to Dean Norris, the guy who plays him, who, who came into the, uh, into the audition room. Hey, how you doing? You know, he was the guy. And he kind of comes across that way when you meet him in real life. Hey, buddy, how you doing? But he went to Harvard. And he loves poetry. Wow. And he is a reader, a voracious reader. And he can talk to you on pretty much any subject. And in a, in a funny way, when he, you meet him, he kind of hides that from you. It's almost as if mm. he doesn't want to, people think he's putting on airs or whatever. He just, he's just a guy. He's just yeah. a guy's guy. He's slow playing. And yet he's, yeah, and yet he's, he's so much more. And when I realized that about him, and when my writers realized about him that he was, in fact, had all these other onion-like layers, suddenly, uh, not even, there was no meeting about it. Suddenly right. you just, you find it trickling into the character. We didn't say, hey, we gotta make the Hank more complex. You know, it just starts to happen. Well, that's something I really, I found also fascinating, is that every character who appeared on the show, even for brief spots, got a chance to be brilliant. Like, the show seems to me to celebrate smart people in every guise, and good. everyone gets good. to be smart. Good, good. I, I mean, I even, like, at first I thought that Basher and Skinny Pete were caricatures, and they turned out to be really sweet good. When, good, they, good. when they decided to stick with the 12 steps. <laughs> good, good. Um, I mean, was that conscious? Did you think about, like, wanting to give yeah. somebody a chance to be yeah. to save the day or be really... Absolutely. Dumb, dumb is funny, and I, and I love... And Skinny Pete and Badger are good examples of, of probably... Uh, on our Breaking Bad character continuum, there's there's Gustavo Fring and Walter White neck and neck at the smart end, and then there's Skinny Pete and Badger yeah. right <laughs> together. But even they had their moments. But but more to the point, smart is good dramatically, because I'll give a good example. One of the biggest fears we had in the writers' room in season four, which was the big season-long chess match between Walter White and Gus Fring. Yeah. Gus Fring the guy who was arguably even smarter than Walt. Uh, at the very least, they're just neck and neck, these two. Terrifying. And one of my biggest fears that season was that we wouldn't be able to figure out a satisfying, see, it's always about satisfying endings. And every season end, you want it to be as satisfying as the series end or whatnot. The big worry that year was we knew Gus had to lose. We knew, uh, right. Like in Highlander, there can be <laughs> yeah. only one, you know, at the end of this season. We yeah. can't have it go past this. That Gus, as much as we love the actor, Giancarlo Esposito, as much as we love the character, they, they're really, truly, the town's not big enough for the both of them yeah. after this season. One has to go. It ain't going to be Walt, you know, because the, the show's about Walt. So our big fear was how do we make Gus, how do we allow Gus to lose, but not by getting stupid in the 11th hour? There's so many... Movies over the years I've seen where it's, there's been a really brilliant bad guy, and you're like, wow, this guy is smart at every move. And then all of a sudden, he just kind of gets dumb at the Until end. Until the last move. Because, yeah. and it's, it's not, it's, 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 and I feel for the writers, uh, the makers of those movies uh, over the years, because it's like, how do you do this? We were just beating our heads against the wall saying, how does Gus Fring, you know, and we kept thinking of the chess analogy. You got Spassky and you've got uh, Bobby Fischer, both of them brilliant, but but there's got to be a weak, weak link in the chain or whatever the analogy is. Yeah. One of them's got to make a a slightly wrong move. Yeah, that the slightly other can wrong move. And 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 we don't want it to to come from stupidity. Our best thought and what we wind up going with is it comes from emotion. Gustavo Fring is is Mr. Spock like a little bit, at least you think he is. But then we find out he's got this emotional Achilles heel related to his, his very good friend, possibly more than just a friend, uh, uh, Max, who, uh, who we see in 20 years ago, who was right. killed by Hector, who was killed by Tio. And so, uh, yeah, but smart is good. Smart is what you want. You, I can't think of a movie where, where I like it that, that the bad guy gets dumb no. because it's like I want, I want 
I want the bad guy to be smart, smart, smart. So the good guy has to be even smarter. Well, know? so how how long would it take? How long did it take you to work that out, Gustavo's demise? I mean, did you know when Gustavo takes Jesse to the nursing home that that's the first domino? Yeah. Or did you look back at that and think that could be our linchpin that Jesse knows about it? He'll tell Walt, and Walt now knows. I'm trying to remember exactly. I, I can tell you, it was it was uh, one of the great blessings we had on this show was that. Uh, AMC and Sony gave us time to think. Really? Uh, and we used every second that we had, but we had on average about three weeks per episode to break the episodes. And when I say break, I mean sitting around a table like this, the seven of us, right. me and my six writers, and, and Gordon, our writer's assistant, who's taking down everything in court stenographer fashion. Mm -hmm. And we sit around, you know, coming up with every single Running detail, and, every, yeah, right, and, right. and and putting writing them down with a magic marker on an index card, and that's at the when you have an entire corkboard filled, that's one episode, and that takes that process takes about three weeks, and at the end of that process, any one of the writers in the room could write that episode. I see. So they'll take those yeah. that outline, that but but breakdown. that that uh, that that breakdown, and then the writer of that episode goes off and writes it, and then hopefully has about two weeks in which to turn it into a fifty fifty two page. And, and, script. and some of those problems take longer to solve than others. Oh, okay, God, yeah. I mean, is, I, I, was, I was continually surprised by the elegance of things like, even down to, it totally makes sense Jesse would grab something in his house like a bike lock to lock up Crazy 8. But the idea that the simplicity of it is also part of how humiliating it is, and that it also allows Walt to kill him without looking at him in the face. Yeah, That yeah. it gives Walt some distance for that first yeah. kill. I found, I was like, that's so... It oh, wraps up so nicely. Good. I mean, did you do you guys sit around like throwing things into the wastebasket and think, no, 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 we have it has to be neater, or it has to be tighter. At the risk of looking uh, uh, less on top of things, <laughs> I, I I know I find it's good to just be honest and say that, for instance, the motorcycle lock, which I love too, when we came up with it, would not have been except for the fact that in the pilot during which I was directing and I was running for my life and right. I, and I and certain details you know I just probably uh, just passed right over me my production designer who was doing his job a wonderful guy named Rob Wilson King knew we were going to be shooting in, in in Jesse's garage in the pilot and he said what can I put in this garage what would a young guy that looks like this kid have in his garage I think he'd have a motorcycle and he goes Rob our production designer goes and rents this badass looking uh, uh, cafe racer. Mm -hmm. I don't I can't remember what kind it was, a Kawasaki or something, an old one. Nothing too fancy, used a uh, red sport bike and, and, and put the lock on it and it was just there as set dressing and I had not, and my whole point of this long story being, I hadn't gone to him and said, by the way, Jesse, he's a, we're going to use <laughs> right. a motorcycle in the future, we're going to have him ride it, you know, uh, None of that. It just I showed up on the day and he said, "How's the, how's the garage look, boss? Uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, okay. No, you know, what I'm proud of on the show. My point being, it, I love it when people think we played a very deep game, and sometimes we played a pretty deep game. But the thing that we mostly did was look back at the tools we had at hand and the options we had at hand, and said, oh, "Let's make use of this. How would you tie a guy up?" Once he's in your basement, what would you tie him to? Well, the basements typically have those steel columns. That'd be a good, I'd probably tie someone to that. So much of this show is the process of what would I do if I were Walter White? How would I go about, yeah. oh, granted I can cook meth. I'm a, you know, if I'm Walter White, I'm a chemistry genius. I can cook meth. But the hard part is how do I find people to sell it to without getting caught? You know, how do I tie a guy up? And you look at what's at hand and then you say, well, the kid's got a motorcycle in the garage. I remember that. The production designer put it in two episodes ago. Let's, and I'd, I'd lock someone up with that. That'd work pretty good. And then, you, and then at the start of the process, you don't even necessarily know he's going to get choked to death with it at the end. So there's a, a bit of luck. Right. You know, uh, but you see the right solution but, as but it's coming. You, well, you, 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 you go back and you, and you take from your past. You, we were always good stewards of our own history. Uh, we always would go back and say, is there something we could be making use of now that, that we plant, that we established before, but right. didn't necessarily plant with the idea of coming back to it. Uh, like Tio, for instance, uh, Hector Salamanca, played by the wonderful Mark Margolis in his wheelchair with the bell. Yeah. He was 
that was a one-off. I mean, he appeared in one episode where we thought it'd be great to have this guy who you think is just kind of a vegetable, but he, he understands everything he's hearing, and he can't communicate. It's frustrating for him, but it's agonizing for the audience because he's trying to tell his psycho nephew snorting meth off a Bowie knife and shooting cows with his M16. You know, he's, he's trying to tell him these two guys are trying to screw you. They're trying to poison you. It was just a one-off very tense, hopefully, yeah. you know, uh, moment in an episode. But when you hire, this is what I love about the collaborative nature of TV. You hire, turns out we hired like the most fantastic actor for this role we could have gotten. Mark Margolis is such a great actor and such a obvious uh, adherent to the old expression, there are no smarts, there are no small parts, only small actors, because he read this thing, he's like, well, you know, I'm in a wheelchair, I don't say a word, I'm drooling the whole time, you know. Yeah, that sounds great, let me do it. <laughs> and he's like, this guy is like, we're, we, we saw he were getting him. This guy who was one of the bad guys in the original, well, not the original Scarface, but the, the 1983 Scarface, yeah. we're like, damn, man. Well, this and is... he did a great job of taking 20 years off of him, too. Yeah, yeah, well, that, our, our wonderful makeup and hair people did a great job with that. But, sorry, I get long-winded. My point being, once we had Mark Margolis in that part, which we didn't think we'd ever get that great an actor in that role. Then we're like, God, we gotta bring this guy back. Yeah. Tio, he's alive at the end of that episode. Let's bring him back in the next episode. And then, you know, the guy's such a pleasure to work with. Let's 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 bring him back anytime we can. Let's let's have him be let's have him have some backstory with Gustavo Fring once yeah. we establish Gus and But little did we know in that first episode that he would be crucial to a guy who didn't even a bad guy who didn't even exist at that point, Gus yeah, Frank, right, and right. then later on the whole thing about you know the bomb and the bell, we didn't know any of that. We just we looked backward constantly, thinking what can we use that will feel very organic and feel like we had it planned out all along, and we didn't. But well, speaking of that, I, I, of the great actors in one episode, I, I couldn't believe that Danny Trejo was only in one. I, I thought, oh. It's very exciting Danny's here and then he was gone. I know and that was not because we didn't like him. He was wonderful. Uh, that was one where we said how can we bring Danny Trejo back? And we, we never could quite figure it out. But uh, Does, through, Did he get to keep the severed head? I actually have the severed head. Oh you do? I have the severed head. I have Danny Trejo's severed head and uh, it is very realistic. I can imagine. And uh, I dance in the moonlight with it sometimes in my, <laughs> in my, you know, um, di in my diaper, in my adult diaper. When you're, uh, when you're oh, I did. We did oh. rent it to a, a movie production. Oh, really? This low-budget movie. Uh, I forget the name of it. A couple seasons back, said we understand you guys have a have a really good Danny Trejo head. I'm I, like, well, yes, we do, young man. <laughs> and uh, they said uh, we, we're doing a movie with him, and he gets his head chopped off. Can we rent it? And I, we didn't know these people from Adam. You know, no pun intended. <laughs> and uh, so we're like. I want to be a good guy here, but I don't. I really don't want my 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 head, my uh, Danny Trejo head, getting getting all messed yeah. up or lost or whatever. So I said, well, I'll give it to you for free, but you got insured for a million bucks, or, or however much it was. <laughs> right, right. You, I'm not going to rent it. You can use it for free, but I got to have I got to have a serious insurance rider on this thing. Now, was there any time that you guys wrote something or broke out an episode and sent the script, and let's say an actor looked at that and said? I don't think my character would do that that way and came up with a different suggestion? Or did you have writers who, I was also wondering sort of along the same lines, were there specific writers in the writer's room who really knew one of the characters? Like you'd turn to them to say, what would Skylar do in this situation? What would? Oddly, oddly enough, not really. It, uh, and by the way, when it works like that, great. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. But we were... It was a great writer's room. There were six of us, uh, no, seven of us counting me, uh, uh, five guys, two women. And as an example of how everyone sort of equally got it, like uh, the two women, uh, Moira Wally Beckett and, and Jenny Hutchison, wrote some of the best hard-boiled tough guy <laughs> scenes and dialogue, some of the, some of the you know, and actually, uh, the, our prob arguably our very best director for just balls out action was Michelle McLaren, uh, who was just as, as as cute and blonde and and and, and petite and, and girly as, yeah. as, as she just uh, as cute as she can be, and so much fun to be around. And then she's like, 
eh, can we have more brain matter? I, I feel like there's not enough brain matter <laughs> splattering the lens here. I'm like, for God, God's sake, it's just enough brains there. And she's fantastic with, with action. So our, 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 uh, our wonderful uh, women on the show would, would write some of the very best tough guy stuff. And the whole point of sitting in a room like this feeling trapped, honestly, sometimes for, for hours and days and months and years on end was that we talked through everything as a group mind such that if you were to name a bunch of moments and say who individually came up with those moments, most of them I honestly couldn't tell you. We, yeah. It's just a group mind and afterward you're like, I don't even remember who came up with what. And the right solution shows up and everyone understands it. Yeah, and, and sometimes the, the right solution doesn't instantly present itself as the right solution. There were times where we had and the right solution and said, hey, well, how about this? And then we said, well, and then we kept going and talked and talked for an hour or a day or a week and then realized, wait a minute, that thing we said way back when, maybe maybe that was the right solution. Sometimes you don't yeah. know it, you know, in Archimedean fashion immediately, yeah. but uh, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But but it does come together as a result of group, group effort. I, I had some questions about uh, references. I felt like sometimes you were referencing other Films. And I specifically was wondering when Walt runs into the other cooker, the other cook in the hardware store. Okay, yeah. And he's, he says, he gives him advice, and the guy runs out scared, and then Walt walks out and says, Stay out of my territory. Yeah. I felt like I was watching in micro Walt's whole transformation there from the noticing the thing all the way. And I thought of Michael Corleone. In the yeah, famous pushing in oh, Godfather. Yeah, are, you, yeah. are, you, are you? Always were thinking of the Godfather. Yeah. Steal from the best. Yeah. <laughs> steal from anyone, steal from The Godfather, parts one and two. Maybe not so much three, but one and two. <laughs> yeah. Just those are as good as two movies ever have been or ever will be. Just brilliant. So I have a question about a specific effect that I'm dying to know about Mike's ear. When Mike's ear gets oh, yeah. shot, yeah. And he's picking away at it. And I'm, I'm looking at the sun through his ear. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. How did you guys do that? I don't know how they did it. Oh, really? I, can, I can tell you who did it. I mean, I, I have a rough idea how they did it. It was uh, it was uh, uh, Greg Nicotero and Howard Berger oh, was and, and K&B oh. Effects. Okay. These guys, uh, and they're wonderful crew, the guys who do all the zombies yeah. on, on The Walking Dead, for instance, and, and many, many more amazing uh, prosthetic effects, sculptural effects. And I can't tell you exactly how they did it, but I imagine it had something to do with casting yeah. Jonathan Banks' real ear and then gluing or uh, gluing up the earlobe, the real earlobe, and then putting the fake one on, and then so that it hang and re-sculpting it so it looks like a bullet went through it, yeah. and, and it's and then sticking it together with some gummy something so that he touches it and it kind of comes loose <laughs> and he's kind of wig wagging it and you're like, Ugh. it was very beautifully done. Oh, uh, so gorgeous! I, I went yeah. and watched it a second time, but and I, it was I, not CG or anything. Oh, I thought I was. I tell you that, that for sure. It okay. was. It was a. It was a physical effect. I also felt like you know how much all the actors, main actors, spent with bandages stuck to them felt oh, like yeah. Chinatown. Yeah, 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 the yeah. Conceit of Nicholson. Thinking of Chinatown, Nicholson with the nose after yeah. Polanski cuts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nostril. Uh, that was a that, that's one of those things rolling with it. He uh, Walt gets his nose broke. He got it punched or his nose broken. All that kind of stuff. So many times I can't even remember. <laughs> I think this was the car crash. Uh, oh, right. that's that he, the one that he where he gets the bridge. Yeah. But he has the band aid over the bridge of his nose, and it's just fun. These are the meetings that are fun. Not sitting in the writers room, but but saying if you put it a little, I, I don't think it should be too symmetrical. I think it should be off to his. You know, and and he looked so badass in it that we kept it on for episodes way after it probably would have healed up just because he looked like a badass. Well, the other thing is, it was always, it was always like yellowing or pussy. There was yeah. always something going wrong with it. Yeah. It, 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 it. For some reason, I also equate that to the perfect aging of the pizza on the roof. Oh yeah, yeah I mean, did good. someone put a pizza up on a roof to see what it would do over several days? You or? know, <laughs> no one our crew maybe because they were so wonderful and so enthusiastic and so dedicated, maybe. I don't know. They, but they, a lot of attention to detail. I will tell you that um, immediately after Skyler reveals the money in the, in the storage space, right. shows Walt, um, I actually freeze-framed it 
counted and came to my own estimation. Did I, you? I was sure. I was sure. You're the kind of person we made this show for. <laughs> Absolutely true. Absolutely. I came, I came high. I came, I, I, I came to a spread of between 40 and $90 million, okay. depending on how many 20 stacks. All right. If you split it evenly, if it's all 50s and 100s, that's $90 million. Okay. If it's 50s, 100s, and 20s, then it's more like There's 60 some 20s or something like yeah. that. The number uh, 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 Mark Hansen, our prop master, gave me, and it was his best guesstimate. He he guessed eighty million. So you you were you're good, man. You're good. You're good. That was, <laughs> I that just was knew his someone guess. was going to guess, and, and he I had it would and he had later. the benefit of of knowing the rough uh, uh, distribution between twenties right. and fifties and hundreds. So good job. That's, <laughs> that's impressive. That uh, was you know. What a tricky prop that was. Speaking of props, oh, I can it, imagine with a frame inside. Well, they had and, a big. You're right, big yeah. plywood box surrounded on all uh, five sides by uh, by by uh, stacks of. But the tricky thing, aside from that, the tricky thing is the fake money is really tricky in terms of. There's like one company that supplies it. Yeah, I have a bunch of stacks in my collection. From and, a bank commercial we did at ILM. And oh, okay. it, it looks great, but you can't film it too close. You can't film it too close. So every time we got in close, I would say, oh, God, get the real stuff. Yeah. And the prop master would be like, I, 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 uh. <laughs> and he'd pull out his own wallet, and he'd be, like, he'd be like watching it like a hawk. And a couple times, and I mean, I just it got no one stole it or anything, yeah. but a couple times he didn't get all of his 50s back or something. <laughs> and then I'm like, all right, for God's sake. No. Um, I, I noticed upon looking at the whole arc of the show that... Uh, Aaron Paul, Jesse Pinkman, really only spends about half a season looking normal and yeah. being healthy. Yeah, yeah. And the rest of the time, he's um, either he's got stitches or bruises, but yeah. at least he's red rimmed around yeah, the yeah, eyes yeah, and yeah. exhausted. For the, did, did he ever get like tired of that? He probably did, but he never <laughs> complained about it. He's such a he's such a trooper. Uh, and you know what I what I told him and 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 Brian too, because they both look good beat up. Yeah. And. The guy I liken it to uh, is Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis looks so good beat up. Right. I mean, <laughs> he totally does. he's a good looking guy, but I mean, you look back at Die Hard, you're like, he you gets more and more beat up throughout that movie. And he like, he gets more and more badass, the more and more beat yeah. up he is. And I think, I don't, I met him one time, seems like a very cool guy, but I, I, I don't, I'd love to have this conversation with him. I wonder if he recognizes that about himself, because so many of his movies, he's very, He's very like, you know, he's got the Band-Aid on it. It looks badass. He's, yeah. he's like, he's rocking the Band-Aid or he's rocking the black eye or whatever. And he looks well, like a badass because of it. It's actually quite analogous to Walt because, I mean, one of the things that Bruce Willis always has is a little bit of a, a, little bit of a vulnerability to him. Like, yeah. like he's propping up a badass yeah. even though he is actually badass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good and, point. And, you know, watching Walt go back and forth between the say my name and... Skyler, please don't hate me. You know, yeah. balancing those two worlds, it it, it 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 built this tension. I was really surprised by. It. Like I'd be watching Walt deal with Tuco, and I'd be watching the worst thing I've ever imagined, like Tuco beating someone to death in front of him slowly. Right. And then I'd be thinking, how is Walt going to explain this to Skyler? Were you thinking about building the dramatic tension? Because I figured there's to me there seems to be an action tension. Mm -hmm. But there was also an emotional tension, oh. and those were two totally different things. Oh, yeah. Did you seek a balance in the episodes of those? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and and you're you're looking for as much as you can. You're you're, you're trying to put ten pounds of poop in a five pound bag <laughs> dramatically. You're, you're every bit of drama, uh, uh, physical, uh, uh, you know, stakes, uh, emotional drama, everything you just said. You, the more the better. Yeah. Just so long as you can reasonably explain to the wife, you know. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean. You don't want to take it too far that you can't. And actually, the, you know, we it's tricky too because Anna Gunn is so talking about that whole thing. That the Anna Gunn is so very smart as a as a human being. She's just a really whip smart lady. And as we were discussing earlier, that I would have written Skylar smart anyway because I don't want a bunch of dumb characters yeah. because they make life easier for for the main guy and therefore less dramatic and therefore why go that way yeah. but on top of that she was even smarter than she might have been because Anna's so smart it just rubbed off on the character and the smarter we realized that Skylar was the more we knew we were painting ourselves in a corner by having it take a long time for Skylar to realize Walt was up to something we knew we had for at least the first season or so, we had, well, he's acting weird, yes, yeah. because he's found out he's got a death sentence. I mean, that buys you a lot of leeway. It, yeah. But, yeah. but at a certain point, it's like, she's got to know. And we realized at the beginning of season, 
three. Season three. You know, we can't put it off any longer. Let's just go for it. And it felt like pulling the Band-Aid off. It was like, ah. And then we're like, oh, this is better. But I thought the tension of her all of season, I mean, all of season two, she knew that he was lying about something but yeah. couldn't put her finger on yeah. it. I found that tension exquisite. Good. <laughs> I mean, That's what we hoped for. But we couldn't, just like we couldn't make the show go on, go on past there's, a, there's an expiration yeah. date, like on your milk carton. There's an expiration date for your... There's only so much drama you can milk out of any given circumstance. And then, you know, in the case of a smart lady like this, she's just going to move on. Or she's going to figure it out or something. But she's not... It can't remain in that, in that coiled yeah. watt clock spring tension forever. You've got you to you gotta change things up. So in that badass tension, I also wanted to talk about... Um, Brian's amazing ability to bring slapstick to the tensest moments. Yeah. I mean, I was finding myself wondering, is he getting tired of you guys filming his naked ass? Or his, in those tidy whitey underpants that are so... I don't think he so... did. <laughs> I didn't want to abuse the privilege. He's a very courageous actor. He's, yeah. he's, he, can, he, he is courageous about being naked emotionally. He's courageous about being naked physically. I would never wanted to abuse the privilege, and I certainly didn't want to turn want it to turn into a, a joke. Yeah. But uh, he's so much more courageous than I am. Back in the pilot, the, the first day he was going to be in his tidy whiteies, I was directing, and we were out in this uh, Tahajali, this right. this uh, this uh, native reservation uh, out there, and uh, it's it's like 38 degrees, 42 degrees, something like that. The rest of us, I'm, I've got I'm all bundled up, <laughs> and I'm asking him to be prancing around in his tidy whities and and I felt bad physically for the discomfort, but I felt even worse for it. I don't like to go around asking people to do things I wouldn't do myself. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, you do that a lot as a, as a director. Yeah. First of all, if you have an episode where a guy's going to light himself on fire and jump off a three-story building, I'm not doing that myself. <laughs> yeah. So there are limits yeah. to the philosophy, but I, I felt bad. I personally bad. would try that, but go ahead. I do it without catching on fire. Yeah. You know what I? You know what I want to do in X Files? We had an episode where where uh, Mulder jumps off the Queen Mary, right? Uh, and uh, I begged Chris Carter to let me do the stunt because we're about the same height. If right. they put a wig on me, I, th I would have you know from behind. I th and because uh, we had a director uh, previous to that, a guy named Cliff Bowl, great guy who directed a couple of my favorite episodes I wrote on X-Files. And he told me a story back on the Six Million Dollar Man in the 70s. Oh. In between directing jobs, he got a gig where he jumped off the Queen Mary, you know, doubling for the Six Million Dollar Man or something. I said, I said, damn, man, how high was that? He said, like 60, 65 feet. I said, what was it? He said, well, you got to hit, you know, you got to hit straight up. He says, it, it hurt. He said, I hit... I hit some piece of flotsam and I, my foot. He said, but I didn't break anything, but it just hurt like a bastard. He says, but it's not that big a deal. He says, the worst thing is all that crappy water you're in. You get like hepatitis C or something. <laughs> but he's like, saying no big deal. So I'm like, shit, I want to jump off to Queen Mary. So when this comes up. This is a time travel episode? In the time travel triangle? episode okay. uh, called Triangle. Yeah. And at the end of the episode, uh, Mulder jumps off the, the, the cruise ship, uh, the, the, the luxury liner that is... Uh, been taken over by the Nazis. And I'm like, please, Chris, please let me jump off the Queen Mary. <laughs> He's like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> he says, no. So I never got to do it. Oh, shit. And now, having said that, then the question arises, would I actually have done it? I would have because, because as scared as I would have been to jump off the Queen Mary, I'd have been more scared to have 80, you know, big, you know, uh, Teamster-looking grips of electric standing around like, you know, I want to go to lunch here, so I would have. I know yeah, I would have. Yeah. Even if I had like killed myself, I would have jumped off this thing. But I, I sixty-five feet is a long way down. I figured if Cliff Bowl could do it, Cliff Cliff is a you know, Cliff is just a he's a normal guy. He's a cool guy. If Cliff could do it and and suffer no apparent ill effects, I figured I could do it. Did Did you have actors? Uh, did actors do their own stunts on Breaking Bad? Did Brian? Quite and often. Aaron? Yeah. Quite often. By the way, I've learned since uh, that Chris Carter was right. Uh, now that I have been a showrunner, I'm like, if some one of my writers came to me with such an idiot request, I'd yeah. say the same thing. No, no, you're not doing that. Yeah. So he was right. Uh, I learned that lesson since. But uh, yeah, quite often our, our uh, uh, you know, there was a, a amazing fight sequence between uh, uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron, and uh, and Brian. That was so the, sad. We, that was yeah. That was hard to watch. It was uh, it was really brutal. And they, they there was uh, or there were stunt stand-ins for for a couple of the, you know, really right. picking some up and slamming them bodily to the ground. 
we've excellent stunt men, stunt women on our show. We had yeah. past tense, who did a great job and doubled beautifully for these folks. But, but I was surprised. I guess the answer is this: Yes, we had uh, stunt players uh, every now and then uh, for a scene like that, and they did very important, crucial roles. But I was constantly surprised how much Brian and, and, and Aaron and the other actors were willing to do themselves, willing to do things that I'd be like, oh man, my hip hurts just looking at that, you know. So I find myself wondering repeatedly, because uh, Odekir Odekirk's uh, delivery is so amazing, did he come up with some of his lines as he was going? Was some of that ad-libbed? I mean, very little of, and, and by the way, Bob Odekirk is a writer as, yeah. well as, a, as well as a as well as a as well as a performer, and I have no doubt that if left to his own devices, he would have come up with stuff just as good or better yeah. than what we gave him. But having said that, the way we did it, and it's not that we weren't open to uh, to uh, improvisation. It's just you have such a limited amount of time to shoot these things. You've got what eight, eight days? Per eight episode? days, and and believe me, they're, they're stuffed to the gills. I can't imagine. And, what is that like? Forty setups a day or something? Insane. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, counting, especially counting two cameras. Sometimes we had three cameras, right. but uh, which is not is not is not the godsend that it sounds like because I found this out directing. Very often, I'd rather shoot with one camera because when you get the other camera body in there, it's like you had the one perfect shot, but now you have a pretty good shot and another pretty good shot because I mean, I don't know that this is a hard and fast rule, but it feels like there's one perfect place to put the camera. Right. For every moment, but if you're jamming two of them in there, the light has to be yeah. acceptable for both, and it's always a bit of a compromise. But but any any rate, uh, back to the Bob thing, uh, you're always running for your life, and and also what is said, hopefully it's funny when it's when it's Saul Goodman talking, but it's always in service of the story at hand. So if you improv. It we didn't. We didn't do. Problems that you're, there wasn't a lot of vamping yeah, on our yeah. show. The only real time I think that we had some serious vamping was the was Skinny Pete and Badger talking about oh. Star Trek. That, <laughs> That's that a great was, That was a little vampy, but uh, <laughs> but the rest of the time, you know, as funny as Saul is, for instance, he's moving the plot forward by mm -hmm. what he's saying. He's giving us information we need. So actually, uh, Bob really, and he was. Happy to do it. He, he was like, "I'm, I, I'm here as an actor. I'm not here as an improv guy. I'm, yeah. I'm sticking to the script." So. Well, I want to talk about when people aren't talking because the show makes an incredible and extensive use of silence. Good. There, I mean, where no music is playing, I, I think of when Gustavo sits across from Hector and he takes forever to sit down. And he sits down on this long exhale. Yeah. Now, when you guys are writing that out. Yeah. Are you writing out this this mm -hmm. scene should take a full minute to come to fruition? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, for instance, uh, uh, the beginning of that season, season four, uh, Gustavo shows up uh, at the Super Lab, and he is box really cutter. box cutter. He's very, very <laughs> frighteningly silent. And it's an entire act from the time he arrives. He, he comes, he, he takes off his clothes. Mr. Mr. Scary Mr. Rogers style, he's taking off the tie. <laughs> yeah. He's taking off the jacket. He's taking his time to hang everything up just so. And of course, it's just, we knew we had these fantastic actors. We knew that the longer it took, you know, a lot of times you're, you're in the editing room and even on the set, it's all about compressing time, yeah, compressing yeah. action, because you want to get to the good stuff. In this case, and often was the case, this was the good stuff, yeah. and you want to elongate it. So in writing, I wrote that episode in writing it, and any of, any of the writers would have done it the same way. You explain everything like in a novel. You, you there's at the beginning of that, there's very little uh, dialogue. It, it, say that act was eight, seven or eight pages long. Uh, typically, an act was from anywhere from seven to fourteen pages long. That one probably two or three pages went by without a word of dialogue, and you're just describing and, and you're what's describing happening. everything you're saying, and you do it in such a way you don't want it to be tedious for the reader, but you do like reading a novel. You want to paint the visual picture in right. the in the reader's head. You want to you want to you want to explain in great detail what they're seeing, what they're hearing, and 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 also you're very often saying what the characters are feeling, which feels like a little bit of a cheat the first time you start writing that way. You like you know the characters thinking this or whatever, and then you realize. It's not a cheat because these actors, it's for them, and they read it, and they think about it, and it somehow magically beams out through their eyes, right. through their person, and you 
pick it up on, as a viewer. You pick it up through the other end of your TV set. It's amazing. One of the most important lessons I learned in the show was how little dialogue is needed to tell a very complex emotional story. I can't tell you the wonderful times I had in the editing room where I, I got to cut my own dialogue, like right. Zorro, wow. like cut out lines of dialogue that were unnecessary, that I thought were necessary to allow the audience to understand what was going on. And I realized these actors are so goddamn good that it's like you just get it. Yeah. I, you don't need to explain what's going on. They, this guy looks to that guy, Skyler looks to Walt, whatever, and you get it and cut that damn line out. You don't need it anymore. So, Speaking of actors working without words, towards the end, there's a shot where um, Holly, the baby, oh, yeah. is sleeping yeah. and moving her hand. Yeah. And I found myself wondering, how did you do that? <laughs> it was uh, uh, pneumatic air hoses run to a... Uh, oh, really? No, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally ready to believe it. No, this is just this adorable little baby named Baby Mo. We had a bunch of different babies. Baby Mo, they were all great. Baby Mo was, was probably everybody's favorite. And Baby Mo, uh, I was directing that, it was the last episode. And uh, we had a couple, you always have two or three babies. You have uh, the, mom, the mom's. <laughs> right. uh, we broke this one, Do yeah, we have yeah. another. Well, yeah, well you, you, cause you only have them for 15 minutes under the lights. Right? Oh wow, okay. And the lights really aren't, you know, back in the old days, arc lights hot. were hot. Yeah. These Kina flows and HMI, whatever they have, they're not that hot anymore, yeah. which is good for everybody. But it's a good idea not to keep babies under them for too long. So there's there's a lot of hard and fast rules. And so you've got you got sometimes five or six, usually moms there with their babies, and 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 you and we had excellent ads, assistant director and Nina Jack was our ad on that episode. We had excellent ads who think way ahead who think ahead more than we writers do, yeah, you know. Yeah. They're, and, they're, and for instance, Nina says, okay, we're gonna be shooting that scene somewhere between four and 4.30. The baby needs to be asleep as written. So she or her a second AD or the third AD is on the phone to all the moms saying, you know, can you, can you skip the baby's nap earlier in the day or whatnot? We'd love for the baby to be sleepy. You know, for this yeah. particular scene. So all the moms, you know, so the baby, they play a little extra with <laughs> the baby right, in the morning, right. worry at home or whatever. And then the babies come in, they're all tuckered out. And, and, and so we put down baby Mo. It was, it, was a, it was a magical experience as a director because in that moment, the baby was just dead asleep. And the mom comes in and everyone, everyone, this entire crew yeah. of, of, of people with their heavy tool belts on and their hammers and their this and that, and everyone's just, Absolutely quiet. It's like beyond like being in a library or yeah. or a, a church or a mosque or something. It's just it's wonderfully sedate and quiet and silent and 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 the, the mom comes in and lays the baby down and we had talked outside and then we're just communicating with hand signals and the camera operator uh, 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 Andy Vogelai comes in the A camera operator and I we had already talked through what he was going to get and I'm like. You know, and, 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 and Brian comes over and he's, uh, and Brian in that moment had told himself, he said to me, he said, okay, if I don't cry here, I don't think there's any more tears. Walt's cried all the tears. <laughs> I think, and I said, uh, I, think, I agree. And nonetheless, he told me later, he said, I, I wasn't going to cry, but I did anyway. I wasn't bawling, he wasn't bawling, just no, a single just tear, tear, sort yeah. of ironized Cody style comes uh -huh. up. <laughs> and then the same thing happens with Anna. And they weren't, they weren't putting it on thick, just, it was so moving. And Andy, our A camera operator, he's got this... 35 pound Aeroflex with shot film. Yeah. You know, and he's, he's leaning over this baby, uh, this crib, and the little baby's there, and she's going like this. That was all her. Wow. She was just having REM sleep or a Amazing. dream or something. And everyone is just so touched by this. Andy starts crying. I mean, silently, right. but literally, he's oh, like, he's like in, you know, with his eyepiece, and he's, you know, his the tears are coming down his face because he's a, he's a relatively new dad. Yeah. And, uh, Oh, yeah, it's just you're so all vulnerable touching. at that point. Oh yeah, it's so touching. It's just it's fantastic. It's just a wonderful moment with n no words said at all. Amazing. Yeah. I, so I have to ask about uh, Better Call Saul. Yeah. You're you're working on a spinoff with Saul the lawyer. Yeah, absolutely. Bob Odenkirk, absolutely. Now, I mean, I have to imagine you're pretty good at shutting. Uh, you know, having run just such an amazing show for so long, you have to be pretty good at shutting out outside noise. But there's got to be a lot of it right now, a lot of people wanting this to be another extension of their favorite show ever. 
it's, it's tricky. This is why it helps me, and I don't say this lightly. It's why I stay away from, I, I just constitutionally, um, I, I stay away from the Internet. I mean, it's, I stay away from myself yeah. and my work on the Internet. I never look it up. It's not that I'm not interested, but I, I just, I know it would, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Heisenberg's uh, uncertainty principle writ large. It's, the, you know, by the very act of observing the particle, you yeah, change yeah. its course. It's like, it's like. Chris Harvard calls it cutting. Cutting, cutting. It's the equivalent <laughs> of cutting yourself to go read about yourself on the internet. And 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 people have been so wonderful. Uh, people have enjoyed the fans of Breaking Bad have enjoyed it so much uh, that it would be, I'm sure, uh, a wonderful ego boost to go looking yeah. at it. But but it, it's it's funny. It's like I liken it to hot fudge sundaes. I love hot fudge sundaes, but I can only eat. Right. And nowadays, I like the petite size. Just a little <laughs> bit of it is wonderful. And then you, know, you start to get a bellyache. It's just like, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And, but then it's like you go into sugar overload or something. No. It's like, it doesn't, there's only, uh, there's, only uh, there's, a, there's a threshold of how good you can, it can make you feel and more doesn't make you feel better. And then conversely, you, human nature being what it is, you, you read one bad thing out of ten or a hundred or th even a thousand. That's the only thing you remember. Is just yeah. human nature is weird. No, I had this. I've had the same thing. Uh, just throwing off my something I would the way I would talk on camera for the, an order of years. Um, so are we? Gonna so I don't. I don't see the. I don't see the point. Yeah. So I stay away from it. Are we yeah. gonna? Are, are, can we talk about? Are we gonna see Mike again? Is Mike gonna be? I hope so. I we, hope. we haven't figured it. I'm not being coy. We haven't yeah. figured it all out yet. Peter Gould who was uh, one of my excellent writers and producers and ultimately an excellent director of Breaking Bad as well. He's the guy that created the Saul Goodman character. By that I mean, as I described earlier, it, the show was always a group effort, but Saul appeared in an episode Peter wrote, and, and so that makes him the guy. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Peter and I, but Peter is uh, just a great writer, and they all were. I'd love to, I wanna work with all these folks again in the future. Starting with Peter, uh, and we are doing Saul Goodman together, and we're going to get it up and running together, and then Peter's going to take it over, oh, take, take it from there after the first season or so, and he's ready. He's ready to run his own show. Oh, that's show. great. He's, it's, he's going to do a great job. Is it going to be an hour? It's going to be an hour. Yeah, it's going to be an hour. It's going to be, uh, uh, we're pretty sure, a prequel, meaning mm -hmm. uh, it ha takes place before Walt meets, Saul meets Walt, and we're going to have fun with it. And, and it's, there's an interesting, dramatic, we, we realize talking for the hours and hours that we talk as we get ready, get ready to embark upon it. We haven't opened the writer's room yet, but uh, just the two of us talk a lot yeah. about it. And we realize there's an interesting, dramatic uh, pitfall inherent in a character like Saul, which is that, because we always just thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have a Saul Goodman show? This yeah. is, the guy's great. I mean, honestly, we could do a spinoff of so many of these characters. <laughs> yeah, totally. But starting with Saul, I mean, it just seems like a fun thing. It seems like a natural. And then it dawns on us, you know, Saul is pretty happy with himself. Right. He's, he's pretty comfortable in his own skin. And he's pretty good at what he does. That, in a strange way, Makes, makes him undramatic. Right, right. It's limiting. The dramatic characters are the Byronic tortured heroes or, or, or anti heroes in the case of Walter White, but the folks who who have self doubt and who are not happy and who always want to attain something else. Saul seems pretty happy go lucky. So we're thinking a lot about that. How do we how do we yeah. uh, how do we uh, make this work? Well speaking about writing the characters, like did you ever find I mean, this must have happened. In the writer's room, you're trying to solve a problem dramatically, and the final solution that you come up with ends up being something where the character does something you didn't expect they would do. Like, yeah. they surprise you. Yeah. Yeah. I love those moments. We had them. The best one I can think of on Breaking Bad was actually very early. Uh, the biggest single surprise Walter White ever gave me was in episode four of the first season, when... Uh, he gets offered, in, in deus ex machina fashion, he gets offered uh, a way out to all of his problems. Uh, he goes to a birthday party uh, uh, where we meet uh, his old friends, Gretchen and Elliot yeah. Schwartz, who are now Fortune 500 uh, or Forbes, whatever. They're, they're rich, rich people. And they used to work with him. And they, in that first episode, they seem to love him. And, they, and he, seems, he seems a little ill at ease, but he seems to, you know, it's good to catch up with him. And, and they say to him, we've heard about your cancer. Please, let us help. If there's anything, we, we're, we're gonna pay for the 
We're going to get you the finest doctors in Europe, whatever. We're going to, we're going to, if it's humanly possible, we're going to make it right. We're going to make you well. By the way, and we want you to come work for us. We're going to give you a job. You're going to make 10 times the money you make now. You can have your own whatever. It's just, it's too good. To, it's, it's not, it's, it's, like, it's like he's won the lottery. And he said that the thing that really surprised us at the end of that episode, there's no earthly reason he should turn it down. Right. Not even a point, as a point of pride or whatever. If you really want to provide for your family, you swallow your pride and you take this amazing deal. And, and instead, because of pride, because of ego, he's, he goes back to cooking meth and he yeah. turns them down. That was the thing that surprised us the most, surprised me the most about our own character. Yeah. It's when he kind of spoke to us and said, I need to go this way even though you think I'm going that way. And it was about the finest moment we had in the writer's room because if we hadn't gone that way, the show would have been very schematic, very mechanical. It would have quickly devolved into, okay, I need $137,000 by Wednesday, by right. 12 o'clock Wednesday. <laughs> oh wait, crows took my uh, stack of $80,000 and they flew away and made a nest. I have to make more <laughs> meth. I have to, uh, you know, it's like punching the time clock. Right. It, would have, it, it had to be, we realized it had to be, there had to be some fundamental thing about this guy. It got really interesting when we realized he wasn't really doing it for his family. And you didn't, and this is something you discovered over time, that you- Yeah, I didn't yeah. have any of this when I wrote that pilot. Wow. I, this is what you get, this is what, as I say, what I love about TV writing. You get all these brains together, you go around, if you're smart, you go around and hire people smarter than yeah. you, and you surround yourself with them, and the best thing you can do as a boss is, uh, is get them all pulling the rope in the same direction, get them all, I said one time, I got in a little bit of trouble uh, at the Writers Guild one time, I was, I was giving some talk to, and I said, they said, what does it take to be a showrunner? I, I said, you need to be a cult leader. You need to, <laughs> you need to be a really effective cult leader. Yeah. Not the kind where, where it ends with you in the jungle making everybody drink poison, but I mean, the cult leader, the cargo cult leader, where yeah. it's not you as the object of worship, it's the, it's the crash DC-3 in the jungle. It's yeah. like, all bow before this, you know, let's, let's build a golden ziggurat, you know, yeah. to, to the DC-3. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, if you get everybody praying to the same God, you know, if you get everybody saying to themselves, I will crawl through fire for this TV show, for these characters, to make it as good as I can make it, that's, that's, what, you, that's what you need to be. I mean, I'm not saying I was always that, but it seems to me in hindsight, Getting everybody enthusiastic about the task at hand, the yeah. work at hand, making them feel like, and rightly so, not making them feel as in, as in it's a scam, but investing everyone, making them all realize they're all they all have an equal share in this, they're all equal partners in this in this venture, that if done correctly and with a little bit of luck will yield something that will outlast us all. I mean, outlast us people who made it. Yeah. You know, out, you know, will will people hopefully be watching? You know, years after we're gone. That's that's that's, that's, that's the bet. trick. Well, that's the that's the seems to me in hindsight that's the trick. So I can't see a better place to uh, stop, Vince. Thank you so oh, much. Thank really. you. Thank you. Yeah, this was fun, man. Thanks. Thank you.